Have you ever wondered if you're being stolen from or if this is just God's will? Stay tuned, let's find out. Hello and welcome to Sea Life TV. I'm Daryl Chesser and uh, thank you again for joining us here today. And today I'm not going to uh, be doing a teaching from my reading in the sense of like a writing I've done. Today I'm going to do uh, just kind of an extemporaneous thing that the Lord's put on my heart. And my mom told me to. We were talking on the phone and, and the Lord just spoke some stuff through me. And she goes, you need to put that on tape. She goes, that just really encouraged me. So you have to obey your mom, right? You have to listen to your moms. So uh, before we get going, I want you to know right here, I want to remind you it's Sea Life Television or sealifeministries.org. I believe it's right up in here. We have a lot of free resources. It's the uh, archives of the sermons from 1975 on for Sea Life Ministries, which includes my dad, my mom, me, my sister, and so many, many, many more. And I'm still, I'm like on my last box, and I think we're around over 800 sermons there. They're for free. Pick a, pick a year, choose a sermon, listen. Uh, it's on your browser, it's on a website, so you can just, whatever you can get internet on, boom, you can listen to it, no cost. Visit that, sealifeministries.org. So today I'm going to call this, Are You Being Stolen From? Okay, where I'm going, the text is going to be out of, loosely out of Genesis, uh, well, 37 on, and it's the story of Joseph. Everybody knows about Joseph. He's a type of Christ. You know about the, the coat of many colors, and he was the, I believe, the 11th in line. Uh, in other words, the born right there at the end. He's got Joseph and then one younger than him of the 12 patriarchs of Israel or the 12 sons of Israel or the children of Israel, sons of Jacob. And Joseph was the next to the last. Benjamin was the youngest. And both of them had the same mother. So anyway, Joseph was uh, precious in his dad's eyes. He, his dad gave him this coat of many colors, which back in that days is, you know, hey, that was something. You could tell he was favored. His brothers knew he was favored. I mean, you don't know if Joseph knew that or not. I mean, seriously, I mean, we can make supposition about it. But at the end of the day, does, uh, for instance, my youngest niece, she's the youngest of three girls. Does she know, like, is she favored? Does she have things special? Or does she just think that's the way everybody's, everybody's treated, <laughs> like a princess? I'm not saying she is uh, treated that way. I'm just saying, what if? Anyway, uh, so Joseph is in this condition. He has a dream, a, a dream, a word from God. And he's not thinking about it because he believes, again, everything's cool. Everybody loves me. It's all great. Everything's good. I want you guys to hear this. And he goes ahead about, and you'll see in Genesis 37 on, he tells the dream, tells it to his brothers and his uh, mom and dad. And it was about these uh, uh bowing down to him. You know, it was like this, dude, there's this bowing down to you. I saw this and it was like twice and you bowed down to me in this dream. It was just a weird thing. Well, the uh, brothers and sisters or the brothers and the mother and dad took, uh, well, it took exception to that to some degree. And uh, so Joseph later on, he goes out to visit his brothers and take him some food. They're out in the fields and they see him coming and they are going, they plot uh, a plan. They hatch a plan. And so they grabbed him, they throw him in a pit, strip him of that robe. And they're going, I think murder was in their heart. And, uh, uh I believe it was, uh, Reuben or Judah came in and stopped that and said, why don't we sell him? I think it was Judah came in and sell, sell him and we can make a profit. So they took him and there were some Bedouins or some slave traders, you know, some nomadic, People drive them uh, camel and buy, as it were. And uh, they made a deal, pulls him out of the pit, sells their own brother into to the slave traders. Youch. 
So after that, he is taken to Egypt by the slave traders, uh, sold to a captain in Egypt's army or a high-ranking officer of Egypt's army. And uh, he's, uh, you know, he finds favor. God gives him favor there. In captivity, he begins to learn quickly and work hard, and he begins to rise to the ranks to where the, the commander of the Egyptian army takes this Hebrew who's a slave and trusts him with everything in his household, puts it under his control. Well, after a while, uh, he's falsely accused by the commander's wife. The commander's wife, you know, she's used to getting what she wants. But Joseph wasn't having any of that, and she tried her thing, and he ran. Well, then she accused uh, the commander, then throws this man who's already been betrayed by his brothers and thrown into a ditch, then pulled out of a ditch and sold to a slave trader. And then slave trader, uh, uh, then the commander who bought him, uh, he, he's then falsely accused. And then the, the captain or the commander sells him or puts him in the king's prison. So Joseph is like going this whole trip. What the heck's going on? And he's there and God gives him favor again. He's got favor with the jailer. He's got favor with the fellow inmates where his administration and his deal making or whatever it is he does, he, he keeps the peace in the prison. He keeps things running to where the jailer just kind of turns things over to him and says, you run this thing and we'll be good. Then you know the rest of the story where at one point, a baker and a, butch, a baker and a, a butler, a cup bear, are of the king are thrown in jail for some reason, and uh, they have dreams. Joseph interprets those dreams. Those guys, it happens exactly like they said. The cup bearer is raised to his uh, back to his place as Joseph uh, told him, and the butcher or the uh, baker ends up getting his head lifted. So. Uh, it's two full years after that. You know, God's speaking through him. He's got favor in this prison. He's been betrayed or thrown in a, a betrayed, thrown in a hole, pulled out of the hole, sold to slavers, taken to a new land, sold to a commander, had favor, commander, then falsely accused by the commander's wife, then put into the king's prison. And now he had favor there from God and things are going well. And then he speaks the word of the Lord to these two guys and it happens as he says, things are moving, things are looking up. And then two years pass, they forgot about him. All right, so you can read this all for yourself. I just want to talk to you to get to this point. Then we know the story two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. Nobody can interpret it. And the, the uh, uh, cupbearer that had Joseph prophesy about him being restored to his position from the prison, he said, oh, I remember Pharaoh. Now, I, you know, I, for, I forgot there is a Hebrew in jail who speaks to the gods. I mean, he interpreted my dream for me and the baker, and it happened exactly as he said. And so Pharaoh called, and after two years, Joseph did not know what was going up there in the palace, what was going on. He thought he was forgotten over here and done. And all of a sudden, the keys are ringing coming down that normal thing, you know, keys are coming down the hallway, somebody to unlock him for the day. But they swing the door open and say, get ready, clean up, you know, put on your dancing shoes because you're going to the king. That was the last time he saw that prison uh, f as a prisoner. And you know the rest of the story. He interpreted the dreams and Pharaoh heaped wealth and position on him, put him second in charge of the kingdom. And he ends up saving the whole world by the wisdom of God that, uh, that God gives him to administrate for those uh, next four, uh, 14 years. So now I tell you all that to tell you this. Many people believe it was the will of God for him to go the route he did. Probably, maybe, I don't know. Many people think, I don't know. You, how can you not get bitter? You know, it's like, well, is, if that's the will of God, I don't want to short circuit the will of God, but I feel like I'm getting stolen from. I mean, I'm betrayed. Yeah, maybe I'm a cocky punk and I speak out of turn, but to throw me in a pit, strip me of my stuff and then sell me and you watch me right off into oblivion and don't even bat an eye. And then I get to, uh, I'm falsely accused in the next place and then 
I'm forgotten in the next place. I mean, yeah, I've been stolen from. My life has been stolen. Years have been stolen. Opportunities have been stolen. Uh, uh, reputation has been stolen. Everything has been stolen. How can this be the will of God? I want to tell you something that I believe the Lord spoke to me. Now, I'm, I say believe, you judge it, but it was, it was for me as mom and I were talking the other day. It was like, I, I don't want to short circuit the will of God, but I think the things that are going on, I, I think this, oper this thing is stealing from me. And I'm going, of course, of course you're being stolen from. Of course you're being stolen from. This, is, this has nothing to do with the will of God. This is God's goodness to tell you, listen, yeah, you're being stolen from. God's will is that palace. It was man's will that it was the pit, the betrayal, the, the slavers, the captain, the betrayal uh, or the uh, lies of the, the wife, and then the jail, and then the for being forgotten in jail, and then finally the palace. The palace was where God was taking him. But not just the palace, it was years later when his brother stood in front of him and then even a few couple more weeks, a few more weeks when his dad stood before him. In the dream, Joseph remembered, this was the will of God. God spoke the will of God to me decades ago. And here they are. This is a picture of the Christ. Jesus Christ came and Satan was trying to steal from him the whole time. I mean, we know that for the three and a half years of his ministry, he was actually being stolen from by one of his own, Judas, who was taking a, a cut off the top, you know, hint, hint, government. Anyway, and in the church, there's probably that going on a lot. Anyway, uh, so you have all this going on. Jesus is being stolen from. The, the people are, are, are criticizing him. They're yelling at his meetings like you see now on television. They nah, 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 nah. won't let him say and bring life to people and help and, and not even have a discussion. I mean, they're resisting him. They're stealing from him. They're lying about him. They're stealing his reputation. They're impeding his journey. He even has to walk through the crowd supernaturally uh, occasionally because they want to stone him and kill him. Yes, he's being stolen from. But the abundance of Christ and the abundance of his father was more than what the enemy could do because the will of God was that cross and the salvation of the entire world for any who would receive. That was the will of God. This other stuff, that was man doing his thing. Man stealing and redirecting and boom, 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 boom. But the will was here. And not even man with his missed redirections and his lies and his cheating and his stealing and everything. Else. Not even that thwarted Jesus from getting to that cross. Because that was the will of God. How, did, how do I know that? Well, because that's what the Bible prophesied before Christ was ever born. He would go to that cross. He would be born of a virgin. He would show his people their God. And then he would suffer and die for them and for the sins of the world. Be striped for them. And so he knew God's will is right there. And all of this other stuff, Judas and every other thing, that was the enemy stealing. Now, the reason I tell you this today is because I want you to know that God loves you. That the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, the perfect will of God is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, well then what after that? Are you kidding me? It is the image of Christ, not as you envision it, but as he does. In other words, Christ in you, you abiding in him and him abiding you by understanding, look, the will of God is eternal life. The will of God is health and wholeness. The will of God is uh, provision and strength. And, and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's the will of God. Now, all this other stuff, whether it's you or the thief, it is inconsequential. It's frustrating and it's angering, but it can't stop you. Once you understand 
No, that's not the will of God for you. That, that sickness? No. That lack? No. That debt? No. The harassments and this and the junk that you see? No, of course it's not the will of God. That's man doing his thing. Just like Joseph, they'll throw you in a pit. They'll lie about you. They'll sell you. They'll steal from you. They'll redirect. They don't know what they're doing. That's why we need to know what is the will of God. The will of God is he's taking us to the palace, just like our Savior. That's the will. The cross of Christ Jesus, not our cross, his cross. He was striped for our healing. That's the will of God for you. He that was rich, according to 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, he that was rich was made to be poor for our sakes, so that we through his poverty might be made rich. There's the cross. That's the will of God for you. You don't need wealth in heaven. You don't need healing in heaven. This is for now. Yes, the enemy's stealing from you. Go read Deuteronomy 28, the last, oh my gosh, what is it? 55 verses from chapter, or from verse 15 on to 65, whatever it is, 50 verses. It's the curses of the law. Galatians tells us, you want to know all of that stuff, everything that's going on in your life and in your children's life and in your society right now are in those 50 verses. You go look at that and you'll see. So if you go read those and then you go to Galatians chapter 3 and you read that Christ has redeemed us, the cross, having been nailed to the cross because cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That was in the, the law. He had to get to that tree, the cross of Christ, not yours, his. And he went there so that he redeemed us by made to be a curse for us. So that we now, the curse is broken and reversed. The law no longer has a curse on us. We've been set free from the curse. And we've been given the promise of his Holy Spirit. We have been made heirs of Abraham. And the, the, the blessings of Abraham are now ours. Now all the promises of God, 1 Corinthians, uh, or sec, uh, you know, uh, first or 2 Corinthians 1. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, somewhere in there. All the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes. And in him, amen to the glory of God through us. If you know that that sickness if you know that that heartbreak, if you know that the junk that's going on around you, yeah, you're being stolen from. But if you believe it's the will of God, you're wrong. The will of God is for you to prosper and be in health. Third John, I pray, brethren, that your soul prospers, that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. The will of God is for you to, to have exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think or even imagine through the power of God that's working in us. But if you believe this time you're in is from God, <coughs> excuse me, then you're cooked. Some coffee juice. All right, let's wrap this up. I wanted to tell you, yes, you're being stolen from. It is very important for you to know that. But just like Jesus, it's not, it, it can't stop you. God has more supply than 5,000 men and the, all their families and no food. Jesus says, okay. He blesses it and multiplies it. A demoniac running up that no man can even keep chained because he keeps breaking the chains. And the guy runs up and bows down at Jesus' feet. That's not pleasant. You know how that guy smelled? How scary he would have been? Jesus went, okay, come out. And he was cleansed. And seas were calmed, and he paid taxes out of fish's mouths, and he opened blind eyes and healed the lame. He showed them the glory of God. Supply, God's grace was greater than the thief. Yes, resist the enemy, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's why I want to tell you about that. Yes, you are being stolen from. Yes, resist it. Go to the Lord and say, I know that's the thief and not you, Father. I know that's not your will. There was no death. There was no sin. There was no poverty and no lack before man sinned. Satan brought that other junk in. 
So if it's bad, it's not God. The more you know and that you know the will of God, the will of God is what Christ did on that cross and his death and burial and resurrection. That is the will of God. That is where he's taking you. No matter how, what route it is you get there, man pushing you and stealing and throwing and doing us, that's, that's, that is it. You are going to the palace. You are going to the palace. Remember that when you go to praise or pray or declare the word of God. It's not God. He's not doing this. I know it seems like it, but I know that he is able and that he loves you. He saved us because he loves us, not because he wanted to train good little servants. No, he loved us. He wanted a family and he loved especially you. There's a whole bunch of smarter people and, and, and better people than you or me that don't see it. Why did he open our eyes? Because we knew. I don't understand. He's going, you're the guys I want. Because you have no, you have no confidence in your flesh. You have no confidence in your own abilities, or your own wisdom. You're just going like, holy, I don't understand anything that's going on around here. This is just nuts. Anyway, I just wanted to say that and, and tell you God loves you. The will of God is for you to go here. And you're going there. That's where you're going. That is his goal. I don't care who you are. That's where you're going. Is the palace or is glory, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, redemption, and, and wisdom by Jesus Christ. The, the healing in your body, the healing in your finances, your broken hearts, the restoration, as we read about in Joel and, and other places, God is faithful. It's been a long season. It's been beyond unbearable at times. But you're going somewhere. God's got you. His will is there to do really well. The enemy's thief is just following the caravan. So don't blame God for that journey. Thank God that he lets you know ahead of time, look, I, where, it, wherever you go, I'm going to be there and I'm going to direct you. We're going to get you to that place. You can't stop. He, the enemy couldn't stop Joseph. And, and you know, he tried to stop Jesus. It couldn't happen. It could not happen. At the right time, at the right place, to the right people, Jesus was born. And he finished the work. All right. I want to end up with one scripture that kind of encourages me. And it's Isaac. There's uh, Abraham, Isaac, the promised son, the one who uh, Mo, uh, Noah, uh, Moses, I'll get it right. Abraham lifted the knife, which was a work of God. God, again, the will of God was never for Abraham to bring that knife down. He was taking Abraham to the place where Jesus could be offered, where God by covenant could then offer his own son as a sacrifice. Abraham, by faith, was willing, believing God would raise him up or do something. Didn't understand it, but he goes, okay. And the angel stopped him. God stopped him and said, don't you dare kill that kid. I just wanted to see what was going on. God provided himself. So Isaac, this guy, down in 26, his dad's dead. Abraham's gone. Isaac is now kind of a Bedouin to some ways, done a little bit of what his dad did, lied about his wife, said it's his sister. And he was blessed. So he, he finally leaves uh, from this place where he had, uh, you know, lied to the kings and stuff. And he got so prosperous, 2612 of uh, Genesis says this, Isaac sowed in that land, this foreign land, and he reaped, in the, and this was, if the land was in a famine at that point. Isaac sowed in this land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. This is the guy that in that land had already lied to the king about his wife being his sister and not his wife, and the king was mad. And here, God's blessing. And the man began to prosper and continued prospering, the man Isaac began to prosper and continued prospering. 
until he became very prosperous. I'm reading from the New King James. The man began to prosper, that's prosper, and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now, here's where I was wanting to get to. This has always brought comfort to me. The Philistines stopped up all the wells that Abraham had dug in the past, filled them with earth, brilliant people. And uh, the leader of that land said, I said, get away from us. You're much mightier than us. You're, you're too strong for us. You're eating up all our resources. So Isaac started. He got on the road and started out. And he said, uh, he dug wells of water. He stopped in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham. He's digging his father's wells out. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Prosper. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. These are the same people that had buried the well and forgot that there was even anything there. So he called, Isaac called the name of that well Isaac, because they quarreled with him. Or Isaac is their language for quarreled. Then Isaac dug another well, and they quarreled over that one too, and he called it its name Sitna, which was contention. Now, here's where I wanted to get to. Everything he's doing, leave us. God's prospering you. And then he's digging up the wells, whether it's revival or prosperity or healing. He's digging up the wells, the will of God, and the water starts to flow, the wells of salvation, the wells of healing, the wells of prosperity. And the enemy comes in, it could be brothers, and quarrel. That's ours. That's our revelation. And, and we're going to market that. There is no trademark on the revelation of God. Anyway, and he, he, he called this last well, well, there was quarreling, then there was contention, where it was like, so he moved on finally to this third time. And he says, they did not quarrel over it. There was no contention over it. So he called the name of that well Rehoboth, because he said, for now, the Lord has made room for us, him and his family, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Amen. I love that. The Lord has made room for us. I wanted to bring that to you to say, yeah, you're being stolen from. Yeah, yes, there's quarreling and contention. There's things you don't understand. Yeah. Jesus' ministry, Joseph, who was the type of the Christ, showing us that, it, yeah, yeah. In this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Greater is he, John wrote, that is in you than he that's in the world. The spirit of God in you, the witness of Christ Jesus. You're going here. If you're born again by faith in Jesus Christ, you're right in the middle of God's purpose and plan, his perfect will, because that was the will of God that men might be saved through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and confessed him as your Lord and Savior, you're in the will of God and you're on the way to that palace. Now today, in the name of Jesus Christ, we rebuke every enemy, every curse, every thief and robber, as Proverbs 6, 30 and 31, uh, uh, yeah, that's good enough. The thief, if you catch a thief, he's got to repay. Jesus talked about in John 10, 10, he says, the thief comes, comes but not for, but for, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's talking about darkness. He's talking about the enemy. He finishes it up by saying, but I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. That's God's will. That's the will of God in Christ Jesus is a life more abundantly. And even in the midst of your enemies, God spreads a table. 
Psalms, remember that one? He will, he, will, he will set a table before me in the midst of my enemies. I believe that's Psalm 23. It is not the presence of the thief and the betrayer and the quarrel <coughs> that will stop you. It is in spite of those things we feast at the Lord in spite of the thief in our ministry or in our business, in spite of the betrayals, in spite of the circumstances, in spite, because we know by his stripes we were healed. We know that he that he was rich became poor for our sakes. We know that the thorn of crowns in his head, the thorns that this earth has to, 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 uh, to, to give to us now, yield its increase. We know that the bruisings and the beatings were for our sins, for our iniquities. We know that he was put nails in his hands and feet to that cross so that the curse would be made to put on him so that we'd be set free today. The thief no longer has legitimate or legal access into our lives by faith in Christ Jesus. Do not believe it when he condemns you and says, well, you did this and that's why, shut up. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Again, what was God's purpose? He sent Jesus Christ because he loved the world and he wanted them saved. He reconciled himself to the world through the ripped apart body of Jesus Christ and the blood spilled of Jesus Christ. Real quick, communion. Jesus took this Paul talks about it later when he's having communion house to house with the saints in that Corinthian church. And he takes and he goes, listen, many are weak and sickly and die prematurely because they, they take this, uh, this bread, this supper, this communion in an unworthy manner. They're not unworthy. If, you're, if your faith is in Christ, you're not unworthy. But if you're taking it in an unworthy manner by not discerning the body of Christ, discern that this body was striped for your healing. He was broken for your, your provision and health. He was bruised and battered that your sins would be put on him, the punishment, the, the iniquities, your passed down, quote unquote, generational curses. Beat the, they beat him silly. A Roman, I mean, hundred guys at least, more. Beat him, put him in a robe and mocked him and ridiculed him and striped him and put those thrown, and then beat that crown of thorns into his head, and then dressed him back in his own clothes, and sent him to where his own people ridiculed him, mocked him. He became in completely impoverished. His reputation, his body, his health, his wholeness, his future gone. He'd been thrown into the pit. He'd been lied about. He'd been betrayed. He'd been put in the deepest, darkest prison. But the third day was coming. Everything was put on him. And so today we take this broken body in recognition that his will is health and wholeness. His will is strength and wisdom. His will is joy and peace by the Holy Ghost. His will is that your body's healed today that you are restored in your, in your finances, you're restored in your business, that you can be a witness to Christ to say in the middle of it, Jesus Christ is good because he was striped. He took the punishment. He became poor for us so that we would be made rich through him in every metric, in our spirits, in our souls, and eventually a brand new body as well. But until this body goes away and we die, his body was a stripe for this body. So we take that today, whatever's going on in your life, we take this communion with the body of Jesus Christ. Sorry. And I'm sorry this is so long, I apologize. But we take this blood, or this blood of the grape, which Jesus raised that day and he said, this is the cup of my blood in the new covenant. 
Often, as often as you do this, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. It was his blood that cleansed us. It is his blood that washed every sin away. It was his blood that set us free. It was his blood that even cleansed the heavenly temple, the heavenly worship and the, the spiritual, all the way to the throne almost, that all of the darkness from Satan and his junk and all the way. And it's by this blood that we say, this is the, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony is this, Jesus Christ has saved us by his obedience, by his taking all of this for us and by dying for us and then being resurrected and taken to heaven by God. So today we say the blood, the life is in the blood. To life, shalom. So that would be lachaim, which is to life and that more abundantly and shalom, peace and wholeness. Take it. Amen. Thank you. If you do not know Jesus Christ and have not received him into your heart, do it today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Call on the name and say, Jesus, I believe what I've heard today. I want what's going on there. I want that in my life. I ask you to come into my heart today and save me and, and forgive me of my sin and begin to take me to that palace. And then confess that Jesus, I believe you are my Savior and my Lord. Today, I believe that you've washed me clean because I have chosen to put my faith in you. You have received me and accepted me into the kingdom of God. Amen. Go get your Bible. You can get it online too. You can read it right online, but I'd start with Gospel of John. Read it five, six, eight, 10, 12 times and let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Thank you again for being with us today. And remember, yeah, you're being stolen from. So what? Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Where you're going will embarrass the thief. God is good and Jesus Christ is Lord. See you next time.